Speed Freaks. Story continued from Cronin to Cunning Playlist. Cronin and the Riddler Squeal. Between the time when chaos broke Cadia and the return of the Sons of the Emperor, there was an age undreamed of. And unto this, Cronan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Last time on Conan de Cunning. What a fun day. But then it happened, as always. <sighs> his joy was interrupted by his mind again. For Cronan knew there could only be one way this had all happened. The Grotz to find him so easily when he was away from the growing war. His adversaries knew too much. There was a squealer. But who was it? A riddle, to be sure. Madnut Krunkelstein, his very own chief weird boy, whose psychic feet stomps were larger than any other. Git Squisher McMurder, the most cyber orc boss. Dacker von Smashhoven, surely not. His winds of war kept him far too busy and far too happy. The returned nostril spitter, perhaps. Or Grinner the Backstabber. No idea how he got that strange name. I mean, who stabs anyone anywhere but the face or the body? But they were like that. A strange bunch were freebooters. A conundrum to be sure, but one that Cronin had to crack. His life now depended on it. That was then. This is now. The riddle had to be solved. Cronin reclined on his massive golden chair. His thong, or something like that in a rare moment of unadulterated glee. A quiet moment, just for himself. As he basked in his newfound trove of knowledge, a thing he would previously have avoided like the rot, he had taken some of the logs and picked capture devices from the latest conurbations and settlements he had smashed on his way north. Humey stuff. He was especially interested in the scorecard, as he came to know it, or the menu for it listed and gave histories and formations of all of the forces now on Aquilonia. Of course, he knew of all of these by now, but also, across the sector and beyond, a dazzling myriad, and what a treasure trove it was. White-haired, slim, short marines, with pointy noses and elder-like features, yet still in power armor, still marines, surely. The regiments, or flavors, as Cronan liked to call them, of Imperial Guard, the Anal Mini Tantrum, or something like that. The metallic ones, with mech boys as actual bosses. Humans were so weird. And of course, the Space Marines, the Adipi R starters. He longed for them to come back in force. He had even aspired a new life goal for the marines came in different flavors as well. They had cultures and tribes and everything. Cronan had always suspected that they had more orc in them than Humi. But now he basked in the newfound thought, goal, dream, raison d'etre. It was not just to spread the word of the gods, to be their vessel of cunning. They had shown him the way. Or at least he had hoped they had. Because if it came down to a choice between their good works and this succulent opportunity, Cronan was not sure his faith could hold. Because he had discovered that they were not just knob marines. Better, bigger, harder ones. The prim anus marines, or something like that. There were also black-clad ones that claimed to slay orcs. Death Watch. 
He liked the idea of fighting them. But his jaw had dropped, and he had seen the light, and this last and most precious of entries on his vista of crumpin. For these ones wore the shiniest armor. They wielded huge spears with bolters on them. They were gold collector edition space marines, called Cuts Odors, or something like that. But despite their silly name, these were definitely the ones he wanted most. They were the best, and did he not deserve the best? But he knew he would have to earn it, would have to work his way through all of the other colors and flavors before they even let him near the gold ones. And it inflamed an already roaring fire of ambition. His war was not just spiritual, not just the work of the gods. It was now a journey of personal discovery and accomplishment, betterment and improvement. He would be the orc that collected the gold ones, the cut's odors. Oh, yes, he would. So much variety, he had never dared hope that such could exist. Well, he would have said that, if he had ever previously hoped, or ever really thrown his perspective into anything more than the next five minutes back then. Ah, the early couple of years, when life was simpler, and he was not yet infected with destiny, caught in the snare of the prophet, had not begun on the path the gods had placed before him. Then, he did not know the dark and terrible ways of cunning. Nor was he so blasted by the ravages of thinking, and the mental scarring that led to the near-constant danger of ideas. Yet this was one element of the ways of cunning that he did not mind. The anticipation could be vexing. He would certainly not have endured it before. But he had grown. He was no youth taking the teeth from his first kill, or any passing grot or snot. He was a big boss of orcs now. Not one tribe, not one clan but a vast and populous people. He had a duty now, to those people, to their needs. But luckily, their needs were in great harmony with his own, for was he not the most orky orc there? Yet still an orc. He understood his people. They had three main aims, all requiring to be met in abundance for the war to stay alive. The first, they would need fighting, the second, they would need food that was not grots, but we'll get on to that in a moment, don't let me forget. And three, they would need more fighting. There would also be a need for gubbins and muggins. What's it too? Cronin knew all too well these days, but these are luxuries. Could be done without at a pinch if the main three needs were met. For the controversy had its roots in the recent past, and the controversy over the consumption of grots had become something of an oddity unto itself. The craze of origrotomy, as discussed at length previously, and no think zone boundaries, and the war of attrition waged by his only remaining rival, Tooth Smasher, in his minor speed war, all had added up to denude his army, his war, of their grots. He never mentioned the last issue, even while alone in the dark. The grots had rebelled, and some even wore hats. Not normal hats, mind you, for many an orc could be seen in headgear, helmets, hats, fezzes at times even, and the freebooters were renowned for their spacious and aggressively marked head-covering accoutrements. No, no, no. These little wretches were wearing premium humi knockoffs, if not the real thing. And Cronin had long ago divined that the reason for the humi's prodigious powers of deduction were inextricably linked to their sumptuous and obviously idea-attracting hats. But on the other hand, Tiddles had consumed what he presumed was their leader, the leader of the Grot Rebellion. So perhaps it would just die off. If Cronan was to take his rightful place as a big boss of all of Aquilonia, then he would need to defeat his rival, and then the Humis first, as they were actual threats to him. But he knew deep down that on the day that he had the head of the leader of the Humis on a pike, he would then task his boys with a systematic hunting down and slaughtering of every last one of the so-called Grot Rebellion. But quite literally, he had bigger fish to fry today. And there were few bigger fish than the catch of the day. 
In his last mighty cogitation, he decided three things, as three was most definitely now Cronin's favourite number. It was elegant and efficient, the number three. It showed he could indeed count beyond two, could conceptualise the worth and quantity of an abstract such as a number. Yet he rarely went beyond that point. He could, but it all seemed too much effort. This was especially true of the battles. He knew of the relative strength of the forces he had, what he would send them at, why, and in what numbers. He understood numbers now, and that terrified all around him. But in reality, in day-to-day -day use, conversationally like, you know, two orcs shooting the breeze while sharpening choppers ready for the next day's crumping, Cronin found that three was sufficient. The need to count to four was seen as an extravagant use of energy, when the same point could be made just as well by punching anyone he wanted to intimidate that much. Risk to reward. His time was now a finite thing, and Cronin knew his energies, though divinely inspired and exceeding any on the world for vim and vigour. Even his were not limitless. As such, he instilled his own rule of three. It worked wonders. An instant success from day one. And it was so simple. Cronin was astonished he had not had the idea before. But then, the origin of ideas was a thing even his subtle and flexible mind could not, or more to the point would not, consider. In any case, the rule was as thus. To bring back balance to his force, sorry, forces, he let it be known high and low that each third meeting would end in a crumpin'. All instantly knew what this meant, and what it heralded. Cronin was going to lay into the participants of every third meeting. But it was pure genius. For none knew what a meeting was, and it was defined by his knobs, who had been instructed to disseminate this new rule to the entire war, as being, the boss says it's talking. Hence all now only came to see the big boss Cronin, if they had simply no other choice, no alternative avenue for a course. But it was very open to his interpretation, of course, as Cronin could define a meeting as a, a conversation, or each individual line someone said, depending on his boredom or aggression thresholds that day. Of course, a flexible system was only correct for such a unique and rare phenomenon as the cunning one. And in no time at all, the boss botherers, toadies and weird boys, all gave him a very wide berth. Yet if Cronin were to speak to someone, or more often summoned them to his presence, then rules were usually off. He could be quite affable, as long as he was the initiator of any discourse, and it lasted exactly as long as he wished. He had blessed silence more now than he had since his first victory over the Humies those long moons ago. But he also had been raising his fightiness, getting into shape, the best shape he had ever been in. And the constant combat was assisting the augmentation of his already hulking frame. Cronan now seemed to grow by the day, only little by little, but never ending. He was becoming. He still had the rival war to finish, and then the Humies. He would need every last millimetre of height, every ounce of muscle mass. This was going to be fun. But back to the riddle. Someone in his camp had been forming his enemies of his movements, his plans, his dreams, his strengths and weaknesses. Not that Cronin thought he had any, of course, because that would be self-doubt, a thoroughly un thing, and certainly not for the most orky Cronin. But how could he flush out the rat, the snake in the grass, not to be mistaken for the snake bites, who did, indeed, usually like the grasslands, but it wasn't them. Cronin was pretty certain of this, as they had been one of the first three tribes to join his war, and, besides, it was known that Two Smasher's speed war had zero respect for the antiquated snake bites, unlike Cronin, of course, who could see their relative merits in his force. The Squiggles alone were enough reason to be honest. Wonderful beasts that they were. Now, Cronin did consider securing the services of Grand, Chains Grand, the free booter specialist who seemed to be eminently experienced for this sort of cloak and dagger stuff. Now, that's Chains Grand, debonair orc of mystery, not to be mistaken for the infamous Yanes Blonde, admiral of an Eldar Corsair fleet that plied the local stars, nor Blaine's Frond, 
the ferocious sentient psychophern of Ramadala Ding Dong 4. But Cronan was loath to engage his services, as he was reported to be a talker. Perhaps in the future, if Cronan's own attempts to beat the bushes did not make the squealer reveal himself. Ah, I asked you not to let me forget, but you did. <sighs> For this brings us back to Grot. For Cronan to master this conundrum, he would indeed need a mighty cogitation, a bout of uninterrupted and terrifying thinking. He would need all of his cunning if he was to disentangle himself from the riddle in which he found himself snared. The identity of the squealer. The riddle of squeal. Now Two Smasher, his rival, had been reaving across the north and central plains of Aquilonia. His remit seemed to be recruiting as many mobs as possible, but also to slay as many grots as he could, to denude the world of the most fundamental element of Cronan's mystic process. The use of thinking grots. No grots, no thinking. Perhaps Two Smasher had some small smattering of the touch of the guards himself, as this could very well be construed as nothing but cunning. But Cronan knew that this upstart tryhard did not know the ways of cunning, for Cronan was pretty much certain that Two Smasher would have forgotten the most important part the hat. And thus it was. The lack of grots had been a real issue, and Cronan had to react with some of the most unorky rules he had ever heard. Rule the first. No eating grots, unless there were no squigs left that day. Rule the second. No fink zones were to be marked by the skulls of humies, who undeniably did the most thinking, instead of lines of decomposing grots. Now these diktats did not go down well initially, or later on actually, but there was little real kerfuffle later, due to Cronan's way of enforcing his edicts. These great rulings were declared to be a stopgap action, and never intended to be permanent, of course, and that Cronan would release these strictures at the cessation of the battles on Aquilonia. In fact, even earlier than that, Cronan let it be known he would revoke these emergency rules as soon as he had crumped Tooth Smasher and the Speed War was absorbed into the only real Orky Force, the Cunning War. But Cronan had been ready for said potential kerfuffle, for he sent out his mighty guard, his knobs and mega knobs. He had not gathered them all in one place for a long moon now, so he was actually quite surprised at how much they had grown. Not only in size, of course, for they seemed to be almost matching Cronan's own consistent growth. They now towered over the knobs of other bosses, but also in number. Cronan had fleeting recollections of the many times he had been asked by this or that Maganob of if this one or that one could be given a place in his guard. When he saw the mega armor and sizes, the trophies, he would always just nod. Unless there were two candidates, of course, in which case he would have them fight for the place, using the teeth of the loser to buy muggins to befit the new station. The loser's head to be added to the pile, of course. But in all this, he had never viewed them all in one place, and the memories flashed back like a bad horror movie when he saw them all assembled. Ranks of them. Columns. He had never dreamed that there were so many orcs of such size, such armor, such power. They had proliferated at such a rate. He called it a rash, like an ever-expanding lesion. Thus he saw his knobs and mega knobs all there, all wearing the black of cunning. Well, he gave them their fighting name. They would be his black legion. Now the name was not really popular at first, but it had a twang to it that made it feel like it could be built on. So all howled in approbation. Thus did Cronan order his greatest warriors, his most brutal thugs in the war to enforce the new rules. Alas, it was this same day that Cronan's bodyguard gained another name, for it was the Blood Axe that they moved on first. And they did not like the new rules, so an example was made. Many of the Blood Axe did not bend the knee easily, but when the sleigh stack grew apace, the Black Legion destroyed any who resisted. Two things happened. The Blood Axes did eventually acquiesce, but they coined the new Subukai for the enforcers that swept the camp and never was able to be shifted after that. For it was a typical Blood Axe name in convention. 
They called them Cronans, of course, as they were his. But then they abbreviated Cunning, and added the obligatory TZ that makes all things sound more orky. Alas, the combination is not for the ears of youths or wee grots and squigglings. So just know that the name permeated the entire congregation of the war and did quite a lot to get the point across as to the depths Cronin's enforcers would steep in order to enforce their boss's will. And in a matter of only a few weeks, the camp was overrun again with the little wretches. Which led on to another issue. For after a month of this, the wee grots were in such a surfeit that it was not just a metaphor that they overran the camp. Hence it was that the mass cogitations were again considered, as this would surely use up many a grot. No, 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 no. But this had not proven a popular idea with either of the no fink owners, nor with Cronan, actually. So its proposal was summarily executed. So a strange situation arose, where it was utterly rebellious to eat grots for the vast majority of the time, which had caused no small amount of resentment, but that the number of grots could be controlled, their place reminded to them, and the pent-up frustration of the orcs to be released. For Cronan enacted random feast days, where it was perfectly permissible, nay encouraged, to gorge on the little horrors. But Cronan had ever been more cunning and had his runt herds caged off enough to ensure a return to numbers, along with the constant flow of them from the very soils of Aquilonia, of course. And thus was harmony regained. Enough grots for his uses, the health of the camp and the war, but they were certainly kept in their place. He even instituted a prize system, whereas one grot had a huge collection of teeth sewn into them. Feast days were certainly very popular these days, but I digress. Cronan's mighty cogitation had availed him the cunning to deal with this event without the use of chains grand. He felt confident of this, and thus did he weave his web, the ideas flowing into his mind like, like, well, like flies in a pile of poo. And he was ready. Two stones, one bird. Wait a second. Perhaps that was two birds and one stone. Cronan was not certain. What he was certain of was that he had just come up with a stonking plan. Story continued throughout the entry. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces and factions of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future. Where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we continue our delve into the Greenskins, the Orcs. For they are a fun and fascinating set of hooligans. It is almost impossible not to adore them. And they are one of the most unique elements in all of Warhammer, which I bet you never would have considered before. For orcs and orcoids are almost universally present in most fantasies or settings drawn from that strain. From Tolkien to online wonderful other worlds, we see them almost everywhere. Yet in my opinion, the orcs of the grim darkness are far more fun and far more developed than near any other strain of this archetype that I have ever witnessed thus far. Yet all of this aside, they are unique in the grim darkness as they're simply not grimdark at all. Now some may screech and tear their clothes in an eastern lamentation at the prospect of anything not being fully drenched in misery and nihilism, but I can attest that so much of the setting is actually very hopeful. This allows the grim dark to be grimmer and darker, because there is light. Yet in the orc we see the utter tonic to all of the doom and gloom, the navel-gazing and the heart-wrenching, misty-eyed nostalgia for paradise lost. For the orcs are utterly incorrigible, and their entire reason to exist is to be in exactly this setting. They are the right race, in the right place, at the right time. And they love it. In fact, if you asked any orc what would improve their day, then more war, more fighting, more killing and burning would be their instant and unanimous decree. But this is also reflected so well in their law. 
the entire justification for their inclusion in the setting. Their root conceptual genesis as twisted elves, broken and reforged in the shadowy pits of Sangarodrim, unable to do aught but burn and destroy out of spite and hate, mostly often a reflection of their own self-loathing, has been well and truly left in the past. For the orcs are not evil, far from it, but their rules, their raison d'etre, are utterly different to any race calling themselves civilized, as they were created as weapons of war. This was at the very dawn of the Warhammer galaxy, and at around the same time as the Elderi. Both the Elks and the Elder were created to wage the same war in different ways. Both were programmed at the genetic level to thrive on combat and conflict. But unlike their siblings, the Orcs were made in such a way as to also thoroughly enjoy it. It is writ into their very DNA. But why, old shiny top servo skull, are you waxing lyrical about this now? Well, it is important for us to see the greater puzzle sometimes. To look a little deeper between the lines, while on our constant journey of exploring the expansive and detailed existing wisdom. Put less flowerly because all of this has so much to do with the topic of today's entry. For today, we speak of the cult of speed, the speed freaks. Now, what exactly is a speed freak? Well, this is an orc that has succumbed to one of their primary drivers, as programmed into their very makeup by their creators, the old ones. And this eternal inbuilt drive is for speed, swiftness of action, now, in their original form, their more mature state, the Greenskins were originally Crocs. They were larger, smarter, as organized as the Legiones Astartes, and as ruthless as the Dark Kin. But they were designed to fight in the ultimate confrontation, the war in heaven, and thus they were made for limited purpose indeed. And from my incomplete perspective and knowledge, this pre-programmed urgency ingrained into them supports my own pet theory that the Crook were created as a reaction to the failure of the Elder in meeting the needs of the Old Ones. For both races were created to fight the Necrons and their erstwhile star gods, the Katarn. Now I have often said that it seemed to me that the Elder Eye were made to fight the Katarn themselves and that the Necrons were matched by the Crook. But the inbuilt need for urgency, for speed in all things, the restlessness and need for constant war that is fundamental part of all Orcs the ancestors of the superior croc, this shows me a desperation for action and assistance. It indicates that the orcs may well have been made later than the elder eye. More so, because the only fragments of information that we have that pertain to the war in heaven and the actions of the old ones implies that they attempted to guide and augment the elder eye, and that over time they lost the loyalty and respect of their vat-grown children. Hence does the idea of a rather limited energetic and almost desperate people, the Crook, come into stark relief, and a response to the languid self-obsession and ineffectual rebelliousness of the previously made Elder Eye. For the Crook would love their gods, their creators even until this day. For this information, I shall make an entry on the Brain Boys, so this one is not so muddled. But either way, the need for action, combat and speed are all part of the Orc's makeup. And thus is there a massive appeal to flying, racing or driving to all orcs. It is so strong that the speed freaks simply cannot help themselves. Like a two-year-old, offered one sweet now or two in only 60 seconds, the child will always choose that which is immediate. Thus it is with the almost naive orcs. For any choice between faster and safer, the former always wins out. Now much is also made of the mystic properties of colour to the orcs. For if the thing is painted in a colour, then it will take on the attributes of that colour, as it is viewed by the orcs. Hence red ones really do go faster. For the orcs have a reality-bending ability that means that if they collectively believe something to be true, that they will bend the very laws of reality and causality, and this belief will become limitedly true. Now many state that if the orcs believe that the emperor is dead, then he will just keel over. I think sometimes too much emphasis is placed on this ability to alter reality on the quantum level. But again, this is for another time. So, for example, 
As the orcs believe that blue is a colour of protection and toughness, that painting something blue will protect it more. Alas, this does not always stand up to the bolter test. But as the orcs collectively and culturally believe that the colour red makes things faster, as soon as a vehicle is painted red, faster it does indeed go. Fractionally at first, but faster. By the same token, and quite hilariously, if all of the red paint on a vehicle is covered with mud or grime or burnt off, and the red is no longer showing, then they do indeed actually slow down a tad. Fun, huh? But have no fear. As we progress, we shall discuss the colours and their connotations in more depth in separate entries. For now, just know that red means faster. Hence, most of the vehicles in any speed war will be painted red. For why would one not want more speed if one were a speed freak? Now that the basics have been identified, I must state that the tale of Cronan is self-written fan fiction only, so it is not meant to be canon, just a bit of fun to highlight the lore and how it may come into play in a game or campaign of your own imagining. And it will be interdispersed amid the base lore to break it up a little, but I will attempt to timestamp this so people can take what they want from the entry. Skip the tale if it tires, or skip the lore if you are in the minority and know all of the units and just wish a mild folly of a yarn to while away the evening after a hard day's work. And so, back to the tale. It was on the dawn of a glorious day that the oddest thing did happen, for Cronan received an embassage from the other war. It seemed a rather un thing to do, if truth be told. It set many an eyebrow aflutter, and Cronan was disquieted by it all, as the scum from the speed wars marched into his camp and were led to him. Cutting a short meeting even shorter, the upshot was that Tooth Smasher wished to deal with the issue mano e mano, or more to put it, orky e orky, a one-on-one -on -one duel. Of course, Cronan accepted the challenge, but it was so strange. He knew something was amiss. All did. But Cronan had some ideas, already attempting to bash their way into his head whilst the parley went on. Something was very odd about the embassage as well. Something off about the hue of the higher rank knobs attached to those representing Tooth Smasher. For each war was made up of many a mob and band, and these others were not directly of the opposing big boss, but were present as representatives and eyes for one of the lesser bosses of his opponent's war. Cronan noted it. He would let those annoying buzzing ideas into his mind when he had more time. And thus did the perfect situation arise. For Cronan knew that this duel would be the way in which the squealer was used by his opponent, but it was as such, the perfect time to reveal that damned squealer, so it could be done with. Thus Cronan had his mighty cogitation that I mentioned earlier, and came out with his cunning plan. And so, Cronan met with each of his big bosses individually, and each was told a different tale. Madnut Kronkelstein, his chief weird boy, well, he was informed that Cronan would be going north to the event. Git Squisher McMurder. He was told that Cronan would be going west to the duel. And Grinner the Backstabber, Freebooter Extraordinaire, had been told that Cronan would be going east. And in this way, as Cronan made the final arrangement with his opposite number by the use of proxies, the place was set. Only two Smasher and Cronan and the respective closest Meganobs would be privy to the location. Thus did Cronan have his sneakers, his shady workers, watch the way the war moved. And it was apparent that he had struck on a winner, for two of the bosses did not move at all, just waved him off with a chortle and a get him good to send him on his way. But there was one part of his war that had sent out foraging parties, parties that had not come back little by little sending out their best orcs to mass somewhere. And Cronan would punish them mightily. But first, 
the duel. And so, the numbers agreed, the forces chosen. Cronan took only his original and most fighty knobs and mega knobs and their mobs. Try saying that fast. What many had now come to call his utter black lesion. And the die was cast. And as he and his men stood their ground amid the rolling plains of the central prairies of Aquilonia, the first signs of the speed war arrived. Plumes of dust thrown up all around him by the approach of his adversary. The first to hove into view were the hovering and prowling death copters to check the scene. Then the first wave of war bikes hove into view. To quote, War bikes and death copters. The orc love of speed is nothing short of obsession. Many greenskins will take any excuse to hop aboard an overcharged and overgunned warbike or death copter and go tearing off towards the enemy lines. Whether part of a larger cult of speed warband or acting as outriders for their foot-slogging brethren, these velocity-addicted maniacs run rings around the foe. Warbikes an orc warbike is far more than just a vehicle to its owner. A warbiker treats his personalized steed with real care, because it is not only a thing of great prestige, but also a direct conduit to the adrenaline-rich thrill of speed. Nothing short of dive-bombing the foe in a blitzer bomber can compare to the raw excitement of hurtling towards the enemy on a bike with all guns blazing. This is why so many speed freaks and evil sons are war bikers. The war bike is a single-seater attack bike armed with DACA guns, massive rapid-firing armaments that spray ragged bursts of armored-piercing shells with every pull of the trigger. Of course, fixing such devastating weaponry onto a bike poses a few problems, not least of which is the tendency for the vehicle to buck and spin wildly out of control when the guns are fired. The orcs find that this only adds to the appeal of the bike, making it more exciting to ride. Indeed, war bikers are so reckless that they will even let go of the handlebars when careening into the enemy, better allowing them to lay about themselves with slugger, choppers, and improvised weapons. <laughs> war bikers typically have a specific set to their features, especially after a really good battle. Their lips are drawn back in an ecstatic, toothy grin, and their bloodshot and unfocused eyes are opened frighteningly wide. They often seem to shake for a good hour or two after leaving the saddle, for suspension is unheard of in orc vehicles. Even in times of relative peace, war bikers have a tendency to let loose the occasional whoop or cackle as they relive their glorious charges into the ranks of the foe. War bikers function as outriders and shock troopers for the main horde. The pile of exhaust fumes thrown up by their vehicles helps obscure their advance, giving them a measure of protection from enemy guns. Some war biker tribes have even been known to use controlled skids to communicate messages back to their fellows by sending up clouds of dust. The Flaming Skull tribe go one step further and are allegedly able to synchronize the skids of their bikes so precisely that when the enemy aircraft pass over, they are greeted by trails of oily smoke and dust that spell out ZOGOF! Wazdaka Gutsmek Wazdaka Gutsmek, creator of the fabled Bike of the Apocalypse, is said to be the greatest orc warbiker of them all. A greenskin legend tells of how Wazdaka was accused of cheating when he won the race of Da Burning Wheels, and how he leveled his tribe's settlement with his Dakar cannons in response, before roaring off in disgust. From that day forth, or so the story goes, he has roamed the stars as a deadly warbiker for hire. It is said that what began as aimless wandering has taken on overtones of a holy pilgrimage. More speed freaks flock to Wazdaka's banner with every battle and race he wins. Many mad-eyed speed freaks claim that Wazdaka is the greatest speed boss of them all. After all, 
Not only do the stories paint him as phenomenally fighty, spectacularly shooty, and ruinously rich, but he is also by far and away the fastest orc around. The devotees of Gutsmeg claim that he will lead a smoke-belching and unstoppable war from one end of space to the other. This is Wazdaka's speed war, the speed war that inspired all the others, and the greatest race in the history of time. Most orcs have heard of Wazdaka Gutsmeg, for his legend has spread throughout their tribes from one orc empire to the next. Few can claim truly to have seen him, but a legend persists amongst the knobs and war bosses of the Cult of Speed that if an orc travels fast enough, he may spot Wazdaka up ahead, a hurtling figure upon the horizon who can be chased all the way to the best fights in the galaxy. Deathcopters Deathcopters are the lunatic inventions of mechs obsessed with flight. Each deathcopter is a single-seater attack craft that has a set of whirring motors mounted above the pilot's head and a jet booster at the rear. The rotors hold the deathcopter aloft as the booster sends it screaming across the battlefield in the general direction of the enemy, its underslung weapon spitting death. There have been countless instances of orc mechs trying to master flight, but only a tiny fraction of them achieve anything more than a spectacularly entertaining disaster. Still, orcs have a cheerful try-again attitude to technology, and there is never a shortage of willing test pilots among the ranks of the speed freaks. The Defcopter was the result of decades of experimentation, truth be told, it has remained the subject of rather a lot of experimentation to this day. If there can be said to be a typical role for the Defcopter, it is as a reconnaissance vehicle. Defcopters range ahead of the rest of the warband, locating victims for their brethren to fall upon. Once they've found an enemy force, they will, with a supreme effort, turn their copters around and head back to gather reinforcements. It is common for these returning Defcopters to then lead a Speed Freak's contingent onto the battlefield, with the main body of the warband following their exhaust trails to the front lines. The problem with mechs is that they never make the same machine twice. Ever since the first deft copter was pioneered, mechs have devised more and more cunning ways to turn it from bizarre conveyance to lethal weapon. Early deft copters were equipped with twin big shooters, but as the mechs have had their way with the deft copter design, it is just as common to see drums of rockets at the front. Such is the reckless madness of the average Defcopter pilot that these ramshackle flying machines are often flown straight into enemy infantry. Nose is lowered so that the vehicle's rotor wings can be used as horrifyingly brutal and spectacularly messy weapons. Such tactics spread terror as well as bloody body parts throughout the foe's ranks. And it is a rare warrior indeed who can hold their nerve after an extremely low-flying orc defcopter has lopped the head off their leader with its spinning blades, while the speed freak behind the controls laughs uproariously. The main advantage of the defcopter over the warbike is that it can traverse absolutely any terrain. The warbikes can attain great speed over rolling planes. The only limit to the defcopter's theoretical velocity is the nerve of the orc in the driving seat. As the pilot has to have a few screws loose to consider climbing into such a vehicle in the first place, this means that squadrons of defcopters often pass their comrades in a kind of oily blur, their pilots howling in glee as they carve a path through the skies before slamming into the ranks of the foe. Sidebar. Zodbrag clung white-knuckled to the controls of his defcopter, Jet acceleration pressed him back into his seat as he shot down the streets between the ruined Imperial buildings. His vehicle's rotors thwopped noisily, the din blending with that of Nazrat and Zagrat's copters to create a deafening cacophony that made Zodbrak laugh like a loon. He saw an intersection ahead, crisscrossed by barricades. Imperial soldiers were crouched behind them, pouring fire into the orc mobs trying to push up the street. Greenskinned bodies were sprawled amidst the rubble. Zodbrag gesticulated at the barricades, 
receiving toothy grins and thumbs-up gestures from Nazrat and Gersgrok in response. Leaning over his controls, Zod Bragg sent his copter into a steep dive, his fellow speed freaks following close behind. Humifire whipped around him, but the Imperials had spotted the threat far too late. Jinking madly through the hail of shots, Zod Bragg squeezed his trigger and sent a volley of rockets roaring down to explode amidst the foe. More detonations followed as his lads added their own copter's fire and blew ragged holes in the enemy's defense. As he thrummed low over the blazing Imperial position, Zod Bragg glanced back and saw mobs of boys surging forward, bellowing battle cries as they poured through the breach. Now that was more like it, he thought. End quote. Conan's Meganobs and their mobs all stood with their boss, bravely looking at a force easily five times their size. None flinched. In fact, most grinned. They were with Cronan, and he always had a trick up his sleeve. But all secretly hoped that there was no secret card this time, no trick, no escape. They all secretly yearned for this to be a straight-up scrap, no matter the odds. The biker sprang forward and made straight for Cronan's lines, but he was ready. As the thrumming and roaring bikers closed, the ranks of the Black Legion opened, and forward came mobs and boys with heavy ducker. Tank buster mobs, they were called, and they did exactly what was said on the tin. Well, usually. But the tanks had not yet arrived, so the tank busters just contented themselves with the apparatif of these smaller morsels. Daka was unleashed the like had not been seen since Cronan's pitched battle against the Humies. The bikers were cut down in their swathes. In less than ten minutes, Cronan and his boys bellowed a huge victory cry as they looked out on a plain filled with twitching severed limbs, grounded bikes laying on their sides, wheels still turning and churning up the earth. The bikers were gone. As the main force of the speed war came closer, the next wave came in swiftly, for the scream of jet engines was heard rolling across the plains. All looked up for a moment, but there was nothing above them. The clangor was coming from the jet-powered vehicles that now thrust towards his lines. Those and a line of vehicles behind, with heavy ducker of their own. Ducker that now started to rake his own tank busters. If Cronin was honest, things could be going better. To quote, Megatrack Scrapjets Orc aircraft are the terror of the skies. Darker jets hurtle through the clouds, blazing away madly at everything in their sights, be it foe, friend, or conveniently placed geographical feature. While bombers fly dangerously low over the battlefield as they look to deliver their devastating payloads. For all their brutal aggression and unbridled enthusiasm, however, Many orc flyboys lack a certain something in the fine art of not getting shot down. Accordingly, after most battles, mechs and enterprising death scouts can be seen securing the battered wrecks of numerous downed aircraft and hauling them away to be scrapped. Should the fuselage of such a craft be relatively intact, the more speed-crazed mechs will merrily weld onto it tracks, engines, guns, and ideally, the largest drill or cutting saw they can find. It is in this way the Megatrack scrapjacks are made. It is considered unwise to point out that the wreck could simply have been rebuilt into another functional aircraft. Mechs do not like their work being called into question, and doing so is a quick route to a skull full of six-inch rivets, or else an involuntary ride in the test pilot's chair. Megatrack scrapjets are a favourite amongst speed freaks and grounded flyboys alike. They provide rocket-propelled acceleration, impressive firepower, and the hilarious enjoyment of ramming through the enemy lines at the helm of what is essentially a giant thrust-driven drill. Better yet, all this comes for substantially less teeth than buying an actual decker jet. These vehicles further allow a downed orc pilot to get back in the cockpit while simultaneously reveling in the half-remembered joys of mowing down the enemy at point-blank range. Of course, in some cases it was indulging in this very desire 
that caused the flyboy to crash in the first place. The array of weapon welded, bolted and lashed onto Megatrack scrap jets is fearsome, allowing their drivers to perform ground-based strafing runs before slamming through any survivors with their nose drill screaming. Explosions blossom amidst the enemy lines as rockets and wing-mounted missiles collide with their targets. Blood and viscera spray high into the air as squads of infantry are reduced to red pulp, and sparks fly as barricades and vehicle hulls are punched through with ease. All the while, grot tail gunners strapped into the vehicle's rear-facing turrets blaze away with chattering big shooters, finishing off any shell-shocked victim, or at least making their corpse dance. Dr. Rocket The Blood Axe Orc, known as Dr. Rocket, was once his tribe's foremost flyboy. After one too many deck-hugging strafing runs in his prized Dacker jet, Doc managed to rip the wings off his plane while chasing a group of Atalan Rough Riders down a narrow canyon. The spectacularly gory carnage that ensued as his hurtling fuselage plowed through the luckless Imperial soldiers rekindled Doc's love for butchering his enemies on the ground. The very next day, the Bullock spent every tooth in his possession on having his wrecked plane customized by a big mech into a Megatrack scrapjet. Boom Daka Snaz Wagons The roar of overcharged engines and the crackle of flames herald the arrival of the Boom Daka Snaz Wagons. Lightly built speedsters based around looted vehicle frames, Snaz Wagons are clad in hastily welded scrap armor. The drivers go hell for leather, for they know that a single well-placed artillery shell is likely to blow their ride to smithereens. Of course, the enemy has to hit them first, and as the snaz wagons fishtail and skid madly through hails of incoming fire, it quickly becomes apparent that that is no mean feat. Snaz wagon drivers race each other to the front lines, howling with glee as they pump their accelerators and coax ever more speed out of their bouncing, snarling rides. Meanwhile, their crew hang on for dear life, eyes wide with exhilaration as they prepare to unleash their vehicle's weaponry upon the foe. Boomdacker snaz wagons boast only a single primary armament. That said, that said, the so-called Mech Special is nothing to be sniffed at. Essentially an enormous Gatling gun operated by a grinning lunatic. This cannon lays down howling hails of red-hot projectiles in a constant stream. Soaring storms of bullets precede the snaz wagons into battle, shredding enemy infantry and chewing their armored support vehicles to smoking scrap by dint of sheer weight of fire. Yet for all the carnage the mech special can unleash, this is not the most feared weapon brought to bear by the snaz wagon's crew. There is a reason that these vehicles are popular with speed-crazed burner boys, and that is the extensive cache of burner bottles crammed into every available nook and cranny of the snaz wagon's ramshackle chassis. These simple and brutally efficient weapons consist of a glass bottle, or occasionally a clay pot in the case of snakebite snaz wagons, into which is poured volatile squig oil, filched promethium, and anything else the greenskins can think of that has a high probability of catching fire. Gangs of howling burner boys cling to the snaz wagons as they roar into battle, and as they speed through the enemy lines, these lunatics light their burning bottles and let fly. The resulting inferno is every bit as dangerous to the snaz wagon as it is to their victims but the sheer devastation such a drive-by scorching can inflict on the foe, both in terms of casualties and morale, is more than worth a few exposing snaz wagons. Even if it wasn't, the crew are usually having far too much fun to care about paltry concerns like getting cremated in a firestorm. Big Pyro The deranged Death Skulls, known as the Pyro Mechanics, are the hangers-on and toadies of the snaz wagon driving mech boy Big Pyro. In their never-ending quest to attain pole position at the head of their mechanized warband's advance, they have achieved infamy for their apparent willingness to set everything around them, and occasionally themselves, on fire. Meanwhile, 
Big Pyro is diligent in keeping his snaz wagon well stocked with burner bottles in preparation for the next fight. End quote. Cronan looked down the ranks, down the entire front from his position, as head and shoulders taller than any here. And it was going as well as he had thought, but certainly less well than he had hoped. For the mega track scrapjets now ploughed into his lines. Knobs were thrown hither and thither, or simply reduced to sprays of offal, coming out in the wake of the devastating charges of the ground vehicles come jets. He was losing a lot of boys, as the scrapjets crisscrossed his lines, going straight through them and then turning round and coming back again. The Boomdaka Snaz wagons had used their considerable darker to clear away the vast majority of his tank busters, way too early in the fray for Cronan's liking. But a battle was like a twisty, turny thing, and could never be fully predicted. That was usually half the fun of them. Alas, as the scrapjets created channels and gaps in his lines, they were then also driven through by the snaz wagons, whose crews now hurled their burning cocktails into his men. Fire burst amongst his ranks and devoured many a smaller orky. Of course, the majority of the orcs who counted wore mega armor, so few of those were affected. But it was indeed carnage. As Conan's force shrank in numbers, he motioned for the call to go out to muster and form a circle. And it worked, well, sort of. Many were far too interested in the fun going on around them, but his elite, they took hold and gathered the best. And so it was that the scrapjets were forced to run rings around them, as any who got too close now met a wall of shields, mega armor and heavy blasts from combi weapons. Also, as the littler ones had been targeted first, the remains of his knobs were very tough indeed. The scrapjets now found themselves smashed by a hundred powered and chain weapons as Cronan's remaining skilled warriors would merely open their ranks to let the jets through, then close their sides and bash them to pieces, creating tunnels of death, as he had ordered. The jets were soon whittled down, and the snaz wagons dared not close now. Alas, this is when Tooth Smasher unleashed the next wave of his speed war. To quote, Custom Booster Blasters A custom booster blaster exemplifies everything that speed freaks look for in a vehicle. Ferociously fast, absurdly heavily armed, and boasting the capacity to set things on fire by simply overtaking them. This speedster is the favoured mount of those mechs for whom going fast and blowing things up has become the be-all and end-all. Such mechanics are so obsessed with being in their vehicles that they may even build themselves into the chassis, essentially becoming particularly impressive centroid cyborgs, whose legs had just happened to have been replaced by an entire war buggy. The main weapon of the custom booster blaster is an enormous turret-mounted rivet gun. This fearsome tool cannon launches heated rivets as long as a grown man's forearm, and does so at a truly impressive rate. Though not particularly accurate, the armament's weight of fire more than makes up for its imprecision, and with the heated rivets able to pierce through even power armor, this weapon has developed a dread reputation amongst those enemy forces who have encountered it. Those fortunate enough to avoid the rivet cannon's fire should not consider themselves safe. For the booster blaster is a swift and deadly buggy, that is a vicious trick to play an enemy at point-blank range. As the booster blaster roars towards the enemy, its crew begin to chant, Burn him! Burn him! Burn him! Then, as the buggy roars past the foe at breakneck speed, the grot in the passenger seat pulls his fire level with an evil grin, causing the row of exhaust lining the vehicle's flanks to project tongues of flame that engulf everything nearby. So do custom booster blasters leave twin paths of flame in their wake, as they hurtle across the battlefield, igniting ammo caches and fuel dumps in spectacularly explosive blasts. When an entire speed mob of these vehicles thunders through the enemy lines, they create a wide, fiery tail that speed freaks refer to as the burning highway. The custom booster blaster is seen in especially large numbers when the evil sons go to battle, for it perfectly suits their way of war. 
Many of their warbands field multiple booster blaster speed mobs that race across the battlefield amidst clouds of exhaust fumes and spearhead mass charges by Evil Sun's warbikers. Such mechanized forces steamroll everything before them amid crashing gunfire and bestial roars of glee. Lockjaw The mangled mech boy, Lockjaw, has oil running through his veins. Hailing from the world of Scalex 6, <laughs> he was a crewman aboard a great gargant until it met an explosive demise beneath the guns of a warlord titan. The gargant's destruction hurled Lockjaw through the air like a blazing comet, inadvertently fostering in him a passion for dangerous acceleration. Now wired into his booster blaster, Lockjaw mows down his victims and exults in the high-octane carnage. Shock Jump Dragsters A Shock Jump Dragster combines two of the foremost triumphs of the mechanic's art, recklessly fast speedsters and deranged weaponry. It is perhaps unsurprising that it has become the most popular form of transport among the mech boys of the Cult of Speed. From a purely conventional point of view, the Shock Jump Dragster is a formidably armed fighting vehicle, built tough enough to withstand incoming fire and high-speed crashes alike. The vehicle boasts a frankly suicidal capacity for acceleration in a straight line. Meanwhile, its rocket launcher has the anti-armor punch to reduce vehicles of a commensurate weight class to blazing scrap. While the vehicle's vicious axle saws are useful in scything the legs out from under enemy infantry. For all this, the thing that makes the shock jump dragster truly terrifying is its incorporation of shock attack technology. Mounted on the vehicle chassis and augmented with a dedicated targeting squig is a custom shock rifle. Eschewing the vicious reverse snocktectomies inflicted by the shock attack gun, this weapon instead kills whatever falls under its sights by the simple expedient of opening micro-warp rifts inside the victim. The technology employed by the shock rifle is used to far greater effect in the massive thrumming generator assembly that gives the shock jump dragster its name and provides its most remarkable ability. By powering up the spinning drive apparatus at the dragster's rear, the crazed driver can punch a warp tunnel through reality creating the entrance directly in front of his vehicle. He then roars through the resultant rift and bursts from the other end, having neatly bypassed any intervening enemies, defences and obstacles. Indeed, many an apparently impenetrable fortress has fallen to the sudden emergence of hurtling shock jump dragsters within its walls. The shock jump dragsters' capacity for winning races and fatally surprising friend and foe alike makes the vehicle extremely popular among screen skins of every stripe. And if repeated use of the shocker tends to send the driver a little odd, well, most orcs would point out that speed freaks are not exactly the most stable individuals to begin with. Boss Shock The Bad Moon's boss, called Boss Shock, is a maniac with a mission. Inspired by, obsessed with, might be a more accurate term, the legend of Wazdaka Gutsmech, Shock seeks not only to catch up with this avatar of speed, but to leap ahead of him and thus win Wazdaka's speed war. To this end, he engages in constant races against friend and foe alike. Boss Shock rarely leaves the seat of his Shock Jump Dragster, except for when maintenance needs performing, or a grot oiler needs strangling. End quote. The small island of Cronan's best orcs, mostly a Megarama, stood proud on the plain, being circled by the remaining snazwagons of the Speedwar. But the dust they threw up prevented the cunning one from seeing what was coming next. For out of nowhere, great dragsters appeared amidst his lines and shot through them. There was little warning, as they did not just appear before his lines, but amongst them. Out of nowhere and then skidded and twisted around in the dust, ready to do it all over again. At the same time, the circling convoy of orky vehicles was joined by custom boom blasters, 
that fired hot metal death at his boys. Their armoured-piercing rivets smashed through the mega armour of many of his knobs, sending them hurtling back as they died. Things were certainly looking bad. To the almost universal lament of his boys, Cronan did indeed have a plan for exactly the situation, and it was cunning. As the old axiom goes, to catch a thief or speed freak, one would need a thief or other speed freak. Of course, Cronin did not think of it thus, as he did not know this very human saying. But he simply did things now. The cunning suffused his every fibre, guiding his actions like, well, like some form of universal force. Gork and Mork, Cronin would have called it, of course. But it guided him nonetheless. For he had been checking on Dacher von Smashoven, had been watching him like a starving grut at the last dregs of a bone that is sitting under a mighty orc rump, and he had been happy with what he had seen. Decker von Smashoven was uncomplicated for a boss. He led by example, and he had acted with honour, had executed envoys from the Speed War, had claimed he had never been happier, or had more fighting or darker since joining the Cunning War. And he simply did not have the guile to lie, was how Cronin saw it. So he banked his life on this gut instinct. For if an orc cannot trust his gut, well, he may as well try growing long luscious locks and debating poetry like an elder. Yuck! And, as previous identified, what better way to beat a speed freak than to use an even speedier freak? Thus it was that the trap was actually sprung, for Conan had brought every bit as many forces as his opponent. He had just hidden the vast majority of them the one place that his opponent could not, or would not, check. The skies. Cronan reached up with his weapon and fired the signal. A flare went up a perfect green, and revenge was almost instantly dished out. Screeching duckages dove down out of the skies, tearing into the ground-based vehicles of the speed war. Blitzer bombers unloaded their cargoes, and entire carpets of explosions tore the ground to pieces, not only exploding on anything they hit, but destroying the planes so that the tracks or wheeled vehicles of the enemy would flounder, and then, at minimum, be overturned or stuck entirely more often than not. And when a speed freak vehicle was trapped, his black lesion gained some revenge of their own. It seemed all was going Cronan's way, at last, as planned. Planned. How strange for him to be so satisfied at the results of such a disgusting habit. Yet the results... <sighs> Truly Gork and Mork had blessed him this day. Yet for all his cunning, Cronan was caught unawares. Later, he would fathom why, of course. He had been distracted from the moment from the greatest homage to his guards, he had failed to watch and enjoy the battle, the fight. And thus it was that the great god struck him down for his momentary lack of orkiness. A last desperate push from the speed war was in full swing. A last desperate gamble to cut the head from the snake, to take a crone at himself. The mega knobs about him were cut down by concentrated fire from the booster blasters and the remaining boom duckers. All fire simply bounced clean off the shield Cronan had in his person, of course, not even scratching his mega armor. But it left him Johnny on the spot, and utterly alone. So Johnny no mates as well. None would close with him directly, but nor could his mobs come to his aid, as they were cut off from him. It was then that a huge trike came bearing down on our hero. Atop it was a huge orc, not quite the size of Cronan, of course, but nearly as huge. It had to be Tooth Smasher. And as he came on, he fired all he had at Cronan. The shield took as much as it could, flashing up like a light-bedecked Thinkmus or a Grotmi display, under the torrents of shot, but this was all a distraction. The trike came straight at Cronan, and he rolled to the side, avoiding being smashed off his feet and becoming a very dead skid mark. But in the instant before he could gain his bearings, he was punched back off his feet. A huge snagger claw rammed its way into his chest armor, yet only a few inches into his actual chest, 
so not much of a bother, except that it was connected to its owner by a metal chain. As the trike went past, Cronan was pulled from his feet and dragged along behind it. Cronan was definitely in a spot of bother. To quote, Death Killer War Trikes When speed freaks hurtle into battle, they are led by the fastest and killiest boss orcs around. Some of these prefer riding to war aboard a rumbling battle wagon or truck with their entourage of burly knobs around them. Yet for the truly velocity obsessed, nothing short of pole position will do. Such lunatic speed bosses race into the fray aboard Death Killer War Trikes. Fast-moving fighting platforms, Death Killer War Trikes make little concession to armor protection for their riders. After all, what boss wants to be seen cowering behind slabs of scrap iron when he should be getting stuck in? Instead, Speed Boss and Driver both are exposed to the enemy, proving just how tough they are by braving incoming fire without so much as flinching. The outsized boomsticks wielded by the War Trikes crew should not be underestimated. Discharged a point-blank range, these stubby weapons kick like a squigoth, hit like a truck, and can rip an armored warrior in half with a single ragged blast. The deafening roar of boomsticks being fired is also deeply satisfying to any greenskin in earshot, for it bespeaks of some serious darker. The main danger posed by the Death Killer War Trike comes from its monstrous passenger, an orc speed boss is a fearsome prospect at the best of times, but when mounted on the back of a hurtling trike, he becomes more terrifying still. With its outsized jet engine, the Death Killer war trike can run down even the swiftest of prey, leaving behind a burning trail of flame that sets enemies ablaze. Wheel size spinning, the trike rips a red path into the midst of the foe, where the bellowing speed boss quickly gets crumping. Sometimes a war trike simply plows headlong into the toughest looking enemy formation its driver can see, at which point the speed boss lays about himself with ferocious abandon. The warriors are hurled through the air like rag dolls, lifted from their feet and headbutted to death, or smashed into the floor by the enormous orcs clubbing overhand blows. The speed boss may even be overcome by the desire to give the enemy a good kicking leaping down into their midst and going on the rampage before hopping back aboard his ride slathered in blood and guts. In order to fight on the move without requiring the war trike to slow down, many speed bosses go to battle equipped with the much feared Snagger Claw. This piston-powered battle talon is every bit as vicious as a normal power claw, but has the additional benefit of mounting a barbed grapnel attached to a cannon and several dozen feet of heavy iron chain. This allows the boss to effectively harpoon victims as he zooms past, and either rip massive chunks out of them, or on a particularly good day, reel in his snagged victims and beat seven shades of squig guts out of them at close quarters. Especially callous speed bosses have been known to fire their snagger claw into choice of victims and then forget to reel them in, leaving the target being chain hauled helplessly across the battlefield at breakneck pace. It is an abuse that few foes can long survive. Death Killer War Tracks are especially popular amongst Goth and Evil Sons. For the former, the appeal lies in getting to punch the enemy in the face as quickly as possible. The latter, meanwhile, prefer reaching the enemy as quickly as possible so as to punch them in the face. Such are the complex subtleties of greenskin culture. Rucker Truck Squig Buggies The first Rucker Truck Squig Buggies were invented by enterprising snake bites in order to feed speed freaks on the move. Mobile pens full of edible squigs, the vehicles kept pace with the warband's war bikers buggies and trucks, while their grinning crews hawked their wares at the tops of their lungs. Once a suitable bag of teeth was slung across to them by a hungry driver or passenger, choice squigs were loaded into the rucker truck squig launchers and fired into their hands, or even waiting gobs of the hungry customers. 
Legend has it that it was only after a rabid attack squig was accidentally stuffed into the launcher and fired into a luckless orc's face that the true potential of this mobile murder menagerie was realized. Nowadays, rocket truck squig buggies are often seen muscling their way through their fellow speed freaks as they roar towards the front lines. Easily identified by their rugged construction, the throaty roar of their engines, and the anarchic mass of squigs and orcs riding aboard them, these vehicles employ close-range living artillery to wreak havoc amongst the enemy ranks. Rocker trucks typically mount both a squig launcher and a heavy squig launcher. The squig launcher is orc portable, often tossed between one crewman and another in order to quickly deliver the perfect squig into the middle of an enemy squad, bunker, or transport as the rocket truck rides past. By comparison, the heavy squig launcher is bolted securely to the rocket truck's chassis and is operated by the vehicle's leering gunner. Though some snake bike crews have been known to fire everything from buzzer squig pots and bellow-lunged screech squigs to the truly revolting and panic-inducing bowel torrent squigs, three... Three types of living ammunition are particularly common. Bitey squigs, bile squigs, and boom squigs. Bitey squigs include any squiggly beast with sufficient jaws, claws, and stingers to savage the target and anything stood close by. Launched gnashing and snarling into the enemy, they latch onto the first thing they hit and do not stop chewing until they are bludgeoned, stomped, or shot to death. Bile squigs comprise any breed the crew can get hold of that squirt, spray, or vomit harmful fluids. Typically launched by the handful, these disgusting creatures squeal and thrash while madly jetting acids, lubricants, poisons, and flammable bio-slop in every direction. The foe are drenched in disgusting and often harmful slime, leading to much hilarity amongst the rocket truck crew as their victims slip, skid, scream in pain, burst into flames, dissolve, or worse. The boom squig is infamous for its defensive mechanism of violently exploding at the slightest provocation to warn off predators. Typically triggered by direct physical contact or surprisingly loud noises, or sometimes even by its own bouts of indigestion, boom squigs detonate with such force that they kill or maim anything unlucky enough to be in the vicinity. Needless to say, these creatures not only make for excellent ammunition, but they are also dropped by the crew as living landmines, and are favourite props when it comes to greenskin practical jokes. Nothing provokes greater amusement amongst a rucker truck crew than hiding a boom squig under their driver's seat, though this can prove inconvenient for everyone if it happens to trigger while the buggy is in full motion. End quote. The ranks of his men charged after the retreating remains of Tooth Smasher's tattered force. Its numbers reduced to only a handful by the timely, yet cunningly coordinated intervention of Dacher von Smashhoven. Yet with all of his speed, all of his darker, Smashhoven would not risk the life of his big boss. He dared not strafe or bomb the retreating Tooth Smasher for fear of slaying his lord and in all of the annals of Orchidum, from the war in heaven until this point. No greater loyalty or love of Lord hath ever been witnessed by his kind. The duck peeled off and sped back to the main camp to prepare for the reclaiming of his Lord, his boss, his dark, cunning master. And he knew just the Orc for the job. Cronan did not know how long it had been. He vaguely remembered the beginnings of the drive back to Two Smashers camp. It was quite a bumpy and definitely ouchy ride. His mega armor had protected him from the vast majority of the damage, but still, he ached all over. He had clearly passed out due to the pain. As he opened his eyes, only one obeyed, only partially. He squinted more than glared at his surroundings. 
he was immediately met with bright lights and the heartening sound of Dhaka. It seemed that the enemy had not been able to find the source of his protective field. Despite that he was buck naked, they had missed it. He was pinned to a tree of some sort. What he would later find out was dubbed the Tree of Woohoo, where Tooth Smasher hung all of his best trophies. Well, until they got too pongy. The lights was darker, bouncing off his shields, lighting them up. But this ended soon, when a chorus of laughter rang out. It seemed to be a new, fun hobby of his watchdogs. As the firing ended and the lights concluded, he caught his first glimpse of the home of his enemy. And Cronin was revolted. For he saw things he never thought he would see. Though many in the camp were of a good orky green, some were not. Too many. One would have been too many in his eyes. But there were many here. Orcs that were not green. Orcs that had spikes and skulls all over them. They were red. They had fallen from the good graces of the great gods Gork and Mork, and had turned into snivelling worshippers of chaos. Disgusting. And they had been accepted by this tooth smasher, infecting his entire endeavour from top to bottom. Repulsive. As Cronan scanned his surroundings bleakly, he was assailed by another horrific realisation. He had been bested in battle, yet he was still alive. This was not right at all. Two large shapes moved into his dimming vision, looking at him as they did. One was inarguably Tooth Smasher, but the one next to him, a nasty wretch of red, who stank of something deeply unorky, carrying a staff, not even a real chopper. The orcs discussed him. He gave no indication that he was awake, was listening, and the horror continued. This seneschal of Tooth Smasher, this corrupted whelp, was Toba. He planned to sacrifice Cronan on Tooth Smasher's behalf, of course, to gain the power to absorb the cunning war and rule Aquilonia for all time. And it was to be done soon. Now Cronan had mixed feelings about all of this. On the one side, he now knew who the Squealer was, for it had been the forces of Grinner the Backstabber he had seen amongst the Speed War. He could not miss their markings if he tried. So the riddle of Squeal was solved. Yet now Cronan could not avoid the reality of his situation. He, the cunning one, would not be slain in battle. He would not lead his war to victory. He would not take Aquilonia and begin his march across the stars. More than this. Worse than this. He would not even die in the service of the great gods Gork and Mork. He would be sacrificed to some mewling, weakling, chaos whelp of a god. To say that Cronan was a bit down in the mouth was an understatement. Little did he know that his most loyal servant had set in motion a cunning plan, a set of events which were not to be missed. To be continued in Chains Grand, Orc of Mystery.